Okay. We're live. We're live. Well, good morning, Southwest Louisiana. And my name is Eric Cormier. I serve as Senior Vice President of Entrepreneurship and Strategic Initiatives here at the Southwest Louisiana Economic Development Alliance slash Chamber Southwest Business Incubator. And with us today is Ms. Tiffany Harmon, who's with Lake Charles version of Pride Staff. And we also have Ms. Debbie Zerinsky, who's also with Pride Staff. Basically, we want to say corporate based in Tampa, Florida. And what we're doing today is the first of what's going to be several digital seminars with Pride Staff and the Southwest Louisiana Economic Development Alliance and our Business Development and Inclusion Task Force. And we're going to be addressing issues of workforce, um, dealing with soft skills, dealing with issues that we need, that folks in the community need help with, both on the business side and also the employee side. And so this is the first that Pride Staff is going to be doing throughout the year. And we look forward to working with them. And what I want to do, first of all, is I want to uh, uh, get Tiffany to say a few words to, to get us going. Hi, everyone. I'm Tiffany Harmon. I'm the business development manager here at Pride Staff. And part of what I do is that I go out to meet um, managers or business owners to introduce to them what Pride Staff has to offer them. Should they make the decision on whether they would like to use staffing or they need um, knowledge on how staffing work, better yet, on how Pride Staff work. Um, so we have Debbie Zerinsky here with us, who is a specialist in her field um, when it comes to talent management to kind of give us some tips and, and um, ideas and some information on how we can um, push through some of the issues that we have with the shortage of talent. Um, so I'd like to turn everything over to Debbie um, so that Debbie can give her her expertise on talent management. All right, before, we start, before we start, let's give uh, Ms. Zerinsky a, a real good intro. She has 30 years experience in the field, working with Pride staff. And from her bio, we know she's in Tampa, Florida. She works with the Southern Region for uh, the staffing uh, company with Pride staff. Uh, she earned a certi certification as a staffing professional from the American Staffing Association. And she's also involved with Vietnam Veterans of America Motorcycle Club. And let's kind of real before we say anything, Southwest Louisiana, the five parish area because of COVID, hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is, has been dealing with a workforce issue and trying to fill spots, fill jobs. And we have a lot of action going on here. And Pride Staff is one of those agencies at the forefront of this. So with that, Ms. Ms. Debbie, give us your insights. What do you see about Southwest Louisiana and its workforce issues? Eric, thank you so much, because I've been pretty excited about having the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, and I've been working with the Louisiana folks for so long, and I hate to admit how many years because it just makes it sound like I'm an old person, <laughs> and I just am not. Um, but what we're facing today is a little different than what we faced before in the years gone past. And so I went ahead right off the bat, and although many of you may know some of this information, I just want to kind of highlight it. And the reason being is what you're facing in your market, even though you've had hurricanes, uh, we just had a bad one last year. Ian destroyed Fort Myers, Florida. So I'm very familiar with, with natural disasters. But I wanted to compare where you stand am amongst the rest of the country. So I, the first thing I said was, well, so what's the population looking like today in your area? Well, the Census Bureau is saying you've got about 81,097 people. I said, well, that's, that's all well and good. 15% of that population is over 65. And we'll talk about that a little bit because some of you, if you've been watching the economic forecast and things like that, it was the mass exodus from COVID of the baby boomers. And that would fall into that age 65 or above. And we're starting to see what we call the boomerang. So a few of those folks might be able to eligible or wanting to come back into the workforce so that may affect that number to some extent, but our biggest um, challenge at this point is 22% of your population is under the age of 18. So they're probably still in school, or for some of us, we're, you know, they don't have enough skill set yet to really be in the jobs that we need them to be. 
So that knocks out almost 37% of your population that we're really not tapping into or, or they can't work. Um, so it leaves us from the 81, really we're looking realistically closer to 51,000 people that can go to work in your neck of the woods. Um, and you're gonna hear us say things like the sandemic. And you're also gonna hear and, and learn more about the population of this 18 years and under, there's not enough people to replace the baby boomers. So the economists are now telling us, we're gonna be looking at this shortage for at least the next 20 years, because that's what kind of shortage we have. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have folks that are gonna replace all those baby boomers. And I just heard from some um, universities over the weekend where they're looking at 10% nationally in the Northeast. They're looking at 25% shortage of students coming through the schools because that's how much less our population is. So now you add on top of there, our prison population. And the prison population's at an all time high and we've got to figure out better ways that we can get some of those folks rehabilitated back into the communities to work and not eliminate them from the workforce. So the other piece I looked at on top of that, because I grew up in the days where we read the newspaper to get our job. And some of your business owners here in Louisiana are like, well, yeah, that's how we used to, you know, Sunday paper came, I'd circle the ad or, or, you know, my dad knew somebody and that's how I got my job. Well, today we all think that everyone's doing everything computerized. And sure, there are, in, you know, like Indeed, uh, ZipRecruiter, CareerBuilder, Monster, all these job boards out there. 89% of our local population in the Lake Charles community has internet. So now we've also eliminated 11% of our marketplace because they don't have access to the internet all the time. So if we think that just only putting a, an ad out there on the internet is gonna fix our problem, it's probably not. So these are some of the things that, you know, you stand back and, and say, okay, this is what's happening in our town. What's going on though? Um, our, right now, your unemployment rate is at 3%. In November, it was 2.7%. I mean, that's as low as you can possibly be in the most part. However, nationwide, it's 3.4%. So you're really not that different locally as we are as a country nationwide. So the challenges that you're, you're faced with there locally are not unique just to your town. So if I'm a small business owner, I stand back and just scratch my head and say, yeah, well, that's all well and good, but I don't have the CNC machinist I need today to get my job done. I don't have the customer service rep to answer the telephone that I need to get the job done. So what do I do about this? And yes, pride staff's an option, but you know what, quite frankly, right now I don't wanna call pride staff for whatever reason. What can I personally do about this? A few things that we would highly recommend to all business owners out there, people in management and, and running your companies, is the first thing you need to ask yourself is, why would someone want to work for you? And we'll hear things like, well, because I pay good. Yeah, so does everybody else. Maybe not. And we'll talk about that a little bit further down. Um, but beside the pay, do you offer benefits? Well, sorry, I'm a small business owner. I don't have a lot of benefits. I can't afford them and I don't have all the health care that some of the large companies might offer. Okay, well, why else though would they wanna work for you? Well, I'm gonna teach them a skill or a trade that will last them a lifetime. That's huge. The culture that you have in your business, can you define it so you can share it and share it with a prospective person looking to join your organization. Meaning, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't like when I come to work in the morning, you're all like, hey, let's, let's have a party. Let's have pizza today. Where I am the extrovert and that's the kind of environment I do like. Or maybe I'm the one that you like to have the latest in technology. And that it entices me as an employee. I like to work on the latest machinery. Or maybe I've never done more than answer the telephone and I could do some typing. You're telling me you're going to teach me how to do accounts payable and accounts receivable. So you're going to teach me new skills that are going to help me grow 
and prosper. You have a company that you have a lot of long longevity. So you offer stability. Hey, that's important to me because the last two companies I went to, they hired me. And then a couple months later, the work slowed up and they let me go. Or people infamously nationwide here, Amazon pays all this money. Well, Amazon has been also known not to keep steady schedules for folks so that they can't count on getting a, a regular paycheck with a regular amount every week. So that's the very first step that you all want to take a look at is why would someone want to work for your organization? What can you offer to that person? And it does mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but you need to be prepared to sell your company, sell your job on why people should consider your opportunity. There are some other little things you can do. Have you put a sign out in front of your business? Some of us have done that over the years. Is it old fashioned? It's old fashioned, it's new fashion. You see those sign spinners out there sometimes. There's no harm in letting your current customer base know that you're looking because some of your customers can give you some referrals. Let your internal employees know, do you have any kind of referral program saying, hey, you find our next employee and I'm going to give you, maybe it's a $100 gift card. Maybe it's a $500 bonus, or maybe I give you an extra day or two off because you referred an employee that joined our organization. Are you doing things like that? Sure, the internet. Do you have a job that you can post out there on your company's webpage? Because nowadays with the algorithms that go through and pick up jobs from uh, companies' homepages, you wanna make sure that's out there. So those are the types of things that you can do. Now, the other piece that's really big, and for all of us on this call and many others, we should be thinking about our future. That 22% of our population that's under 18, what are we doing to start to educate those folks on their future? Besides teaching them math and science and all the other stuff that we learned in high school, if we can remember back to those, those days, but what are we doing to be involved with our schools to let them know about what kinds of skill sets and jobs we have here in our community? And you hear this even from the colleges. The colleges realize that not everyone's college material. And some are. So in some cases, if I need a financial analyst and they've got to be good at accounting and, and so I really need them to have a degree in accounting, so be it. But my CNC machinist, you know what, if this guy's been home and he tells me right out of high school that he's learned to work some electronics with his dad out in the garage, because when the Keurig stopped working, making the coffee, what did dad do? He didn't toss it in the trash. He took it in the garage and he took out the little soldering gun and he showed me how to just zap a little spot and fix it. Would I not enjoy hiring that 18 year old for my business? Because I could show him how to use the machinery. I could teach him how to, you know, and maybe the dad has already taught him how to use measuring tapes. Many times from our, our steel fabricators and shops, they want something as basic as, will you show up for work every day? And can you read a tape measure? You could do those two things. I will teach you this skill. I will teach you this trade. And that offers us as business owners and managers trying to hire people another source that sometimes we think we already have to find someone who's been a CNC machinist, but it really doesn't take us all that much time to train the person or to give someone at a school that opportunity. But that also means I have to be brave enough to call the schools and let them know that, hey, I'm a business owner. And I have an opening at my, I'm a small insurance business and I'm looking for someone who could answer my phone. Someone who's pleasant. Someone who knows how to interact with people. Well, again, I look at the, the school population. How would I know that? Well, I'm going to ask the student, tell me, were you involved in any school extracurricular activities? Because that tells me a little bit about their ambition. I mean, would I not want to take the kid who, you know, they were on the, the track team or they were in the band or um, whatever activity they may have done at school or, hey, I did some babysitting. My parents made me cut grass. 
You know, they, they may not have like cutting the grass, but it gave them a skill and responsibility to show an employer that they are willing to do what it takes to get a job done. They learned what that means. So Ms. Deb, quick question. Sure. I'm looking at the white paper, Pride Staff on, on Sands Dimmick. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it stands out to me is that when you're adapting your talent attraction strategies to leverage what works now, it says, explain what's in it for me for potential candidates. Go into a little depth about that, that mindset. Exactly, Eric. And that's what we've been just talking a little bit about. So, so first of all, you need to know what you have to offer and then translate that to the candidates. What benefit is it to them? Why would they want to learn this new skill? Why would they want to take a look at your company? And that's where I'm not going to say that money is not important. I, you know, we all work because we have bills and we, we need our money to pay our stuff. But put that on the back burner for a second. And as an employer, I need to be thinking about how am I painting the bigger picture for these candidates? What's in it for them? Why would they want to do this? Now, that entails a different mindset because for those of us who grew up I mean, you have different generations. There was a mindset, you, 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 you go to school, get whatever education you need to get a job, and you're happy to get a job. The, the boss or company didn't have to tell you why you should do this. This is a little different. Why is that the case? Well, there's a couple things at play here. Because of the, the shortage of candidates, people have a lot of choices. So I could be picky about which job I want. Back in the 50s and 60s, when that mindset was, hey, I'm thankful I can get a job, it's because there were a lot of people and not as many jobs at the time. So I had to put my best foot forward and hope <laughs> and, 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 and do all the things and say, God, I, I hope they, they pick me. And I'm so thankful if I got the job. Where today... There might be 10 companies that need only the one person that's available. So they it's reversed now where the candidates in the driver's seat to look at you and you and you and you and decide which one sounds the best for them personally. Mm -hmm. Okay. And back then in the 50s and 60s, most of us, both parents started working because they both needed, like they weren't both working and then they both started to work because in order to financially support the family. Well, now they've been doing that and guess what's happened? They've accumulated a little bit more money and as many of us would drive around and see, that kid, as we call him now, has got a thousand dollar phone in their hand. Yeah. Back in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have that in our hand. And so kids today are saying, well, why do I need to work? I already got my $1,000 cell phone. My parents just gave me a new car or it might not be brand new, but new to them. So they're financially not having to run out and go get a job like they did back in the 50s and 60s and 70s if they wanted things. So Tiffany, get in the conversation. In the Lake area with Pride staff and what y'all working with in this marketplace, what are y'all seeing? Well, what we're seeing is that, you know, you, we do have candidates that come in and then, um, you know, some of them do, don't have that stability when it comes to the workforce um, that most employers would uh, desire. Um, I think that the, the big picture is what's in it for me um, when it comes to candidates going to employers and saying, OK, hey, why should I work for you? What do you have to offer? Um, I think that it is a different mindset when it comes to the older generation. Um, versus the generation that is coming maybe behind us and then the generation that is of right now. Um, it's just a difference in where can I be planted and, and how can I bloom? Um, I think if people will understand, you know, um, when you have employers that are willing to teach you, train you, give you skill sets that you have not learned within your upbringing and sometimes depending on what you went to school for um, and you're able to easily transition into something new, um, you would you would get the feel of how working for a certain employers may benefit you, um, but I do know the next the generation that comes behind us might be more quick to uh, job hop, um, and that can be many different reasons. May not be just for uh, benefits. What benefits may or may not be offered. Sometimes it is pay. Um, 
But I think the overall picture, if we get an understanding, like if you are in a good work environment, you have awesome leadership, um, then everything else could follow. There's something else that I noticed on the white paper, and that is conduct a gap analysis. Could y'all explain that a little bit? I'll sure. read it again. It's take a proactive approach to workforce planning. And one of those is to aspects is conduct a gap analysis. How does how does an employer address that issue? Well, that's typically where they look to see almost doing inventory of what you have for employees. You know, and if I look around and say, wow, I've you know what, I'm lucky. I've not had turnover in years. But then I stand back and say, okay, but are your existing employees, do they know the latest technology? Do they know the latest techniques? They may not like the younger person that we just put on staff because the new person has all these new ideas. And that's mm -hmm. uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. as an employer, I constantly have to be looking at what can I be doing to upgrade my entire team so they do have the most relevant uh, newest thoughts of what we can do to keep moving our company forward. A quick example of that would be, you know, there was such a shortage of restaurant people. And I know initially we all got frustrated. I hate going into like Panera or, so, or McDonald's even and having to push the button for, to order my food. But they have the companies had to get creative on what do they do when they can't hire someone to do that job. So your gap analysis is really looking to see what am I doing in my business? Where am I missing some skills? And how can I overcome that either by finding some of the skills or do I need to change how we do that? Workplace culture. That is an evolving dynamic all over the planet. And in Southwest Louisiana, we're going through the same thing and it's pushed by a number of things generational changes, uh, lack of housing has created a cultural change here also. So from the Pride staff standpoint and looking at the five parish area, how important is you know the culture of these jobs and how do you keep up with maybe a younger generation that has a different perspective on what kind of culture they're looking for? Well, there's a couple of things that you have to take a look at is and that's why you're always asking people you're interviewing what's important to them, because I have to understand what kind of culture, because that's really what they're telling you when they say, hey, I need something close to home. The average commute time in Lake Charles is 17.9 minutes. Now, I found that pretty fascinating because, again, nationwide, that's about the same number. Mm -hmm. So that's important to people. And where did that come from? The gas prices going, you know, bonkers up and down. And, and that became important to people. So is that part of the culture when I say, look, you know what, we're no longer eight to five. If the commute for you is a little bit longer and you can't get here late 30, but you're willing to stay, but oh no, you want to leave at 430, but you can do this. I need to, as a, an employer, learn to be a little bit more flexible which I may not have been in the past, but to be saying, hey, I've got to listen to what people are wanting today for that flexibility. And Tiffany, what are it, your insights on that? Um, I, I agree. I think meeting people where they are um, because different people have different needs, different situations um, in, in a person's life might be different. So we may hire somebody that may struggle with um, with, with learning new tasks, you know, being a little bit more patient with them until till they till they grasp it so that they can grow. Um, leaving time early if they are able to show up work show up to work early uh, might be beneficial to them so they can get to the place to where they can work that typical eight to five, the full shift. Um, I do think that meeting people where they are can give them a sense that, hey, I have an employer that cares. I have leadership that says, okay, hey, if you can do these things or you have open communication with me, then I know exactly where you are so that I can help build you up or bring you up to the standards that, you know, we desire of you if you're just not there yet. So I do think the the big thing is to understanding your um your employees, understanding, you know, some of the dynamics that they might be facing and the time that they might need in order to um fulfill like a desire of an environment, a culture that you're trying to create. So having the ability to work with people where they are, 
until they're able to um, come up to certain standards. I think that is that that's big because some people just want to know that you do care and they're not just a number and that they do matter and then they're not easily uh, they're not so quick to be replaced because of how they might be identified if that makes sense. Wonderful. Now let's let's do a little uh, quick little update. We want to welcome anyone who's watching right now. This is uh, Pride staff and the Southwest Louisiana Economic Development Alliance, Chamber Southwest Business Development and Inclusion Task Force, working together to have some conversations led by Pride staff and their talented teams across the country talking about workforce issues. And if anyone has any questions, you are open to, the, the system is open for you to throw some questions to us and we'll get to them. Now, there's something else that I noticed that's pretty interesting. Uh, we always talk about, you know, one thing you'll notice, large corporate companies, large corporations do have websites that are active. You know, they have the, the budget to do things and provide videos, pictures, and things of that nature. One of the things that we always talk about from the uh, business development side is marketing and, you know, get business, make money. But I noticed something on, on this white page again, I, and I love this white page. It talks about um, you leverage your social media to showcase why your company is a great place to work. Essentially, let's translate that. You got to market your business not only to sell and make money, but you got to also market your business as a cool place to be. Small business folks, though, a mom and pop shop that's struggling too, sometimes they don't always want to put the time in on that because they're so caught with everything else they got to deal with. How do you encourage them to do this if they're looking for talent? Well, Tiffany and the team locally do a great job about this because, yes, as a business owner, we may not be able to do it ourselves, but we've got staff and our staff has friends and family. And a lot of us have Facebook and Instagram. Um, when you're using those tools and you, you make it OK for your staff to share things on their pages, and then all of a sudden people are like, wow, it looks like you work at a really cool place. I see that you're, you know, you guys had a birthday party for one of your coworkers the other day. Or, you know, May, May uh, Cinco de Mayo is coming up. Looks like you did a big, you know, celebration or Mardi Gras. Man, you guys had a blast at your office. Right. That helps to promote the local business, the culture of that company and what people think about. And writing and getting your internal employees to write a Google review for yourself to say, hey, I love working here with these folks. That That's also a big thing because people notice that stuff. You may not think they do, but you also, again, though, as a business owner, need to give permission to your folks to let them know it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to add, if I can, like celebrating your employees, um, whether it's a birthday, anniversary, um, whether they met like a specific milestone um, on their goal chart, um, that, that can show people from the outside that, hey, not only do they enjoy working at their local facility, but they, they, they promote each other, they lift each other up. And that keeps us in, um, in, internally encouraged to want to do more. Um, as well as we want to attract more to us so that people understand that, hey, we have fun while we work. So let me ask this also. The, um, I've had folks call here at the Alliance Chamber. They will maybe use a LinkedIn, get into and see a job opening, get to this company, fill out everything that's that they're supposed to fill out, and they never hear anything back. And I tend to find that, you know, we get it. All companies, and you know, you're not gonna respond to everything. But I sometimes I've and I've gotten numerous calls about this. You know, what do we do? Um, if you don't have a network that you can talk to someone and know someone that's actually in the company that might help you go get some backdoor information. But if you're a person who's sight unseen, you see a job ad you reply to it, and then you don't hear anything back, that creates an issue for certain people when it comes to credibility and trust. I need some insights on that. That is probably the number one frustration that job seekers have, is getting no feedback or going silent when they've responded to, to your ad or reaching out to you. And with today's technology, if you don't know how, heck, you can call our office or call a friend who knows how to use technology, but to the email address that you're having them submit that, you can have 
a response that automatically feeds back to them that says, thanks for applying. We're gonna review your information. If you haven't heard from us, please feel free to call us at and ask for so-and-so. You could do something like that to at least acknowledge that they've responded. And a lot of the job boards also let you put something like that in there. But again, a lot of people just don't take the time to use it. And it ends up leaving that bitter taste with the candidate in mind. So and then they don't have a good those complaints? Um, e yes, um, I know here at Pride Staff, we continually to try to follow up with those that we submit resumes to so that we can get that feedback. Um, the worst case is that we don't never want a candidate or someone applying to a job to be sitting on standby um, because there's just one avenue that they're looking at um, when it comes to applying to an employer. And when our recruiters send those resumes, um, they're constantly following up to get that feedback. So communication is key. Um, especially when you have people applying to jobs. Um, if they are not going to be invited into an interview, I think, you know, whether you're sending them an email that says, hey, thanks for replying. Um, we've decided to move on with another candidate. Um, we'll give them that closure that they need um, to, to move on to look for other opportunities. So let's change the conversation. It's 1030. We're going to end at 1045. Let's change the conversation talk about the actual potential employee. What do they need to bring to the game? They need to be prepared, meaning, first of all, put together a resume. There's no reason why anyone cannot have a decent resume put together. There's tons and tons of resources on the internet um, that they just need to go in there and it'll give them pretty much a shell that they just have to type in a little bit of information. They can come to our office. We can help them get one created very easily at no cost. Um, but they've got to be able to sell themselves and be prepared to talk about what makes them a good employee. So just like the client has to sell them on why should they want to work there, they have to be thinking, why would they want to hire me? I'm in school right now with 20 other kids sitting next to me. Out of the 20 of us, why should they pick me over everybody else? So there's little things that I may not think about of, hey, I'm involved in my church, or I do babysitting, or I volunteered for this, or I was on that team. That stuff matters on your resume. As an adult, the same thing of not just the skill set you have from work, but any other community involvement is pretty important. Like I'm involved with the, the Alliance mm -hmm. because people want to know the whole you. And so you've got to be prepared to sell yourself and present yourself and dressing the part. We have people that come in, right, Tiffany? And, and we, we don't want to roll our eyes, but we want to roll our eyes and say, what were you thinking? Because you weren't thinking. All right. Here for a job interview. So and it looks like you came to clean the building. You mean when I show up with a t-shirt, flip-flops, and shorts looking for an administrative job, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> uh, yep, Eric, it, that's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a degree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, uh, we've had people walk in and they no, bring all their kids with them. And it's like, I appreciate it, but you know you're here for a professional interview. Right. You know, in one office, we had someone bring their dog with them. And, and we all looked at each other like, how would this adult like even think it's acceptable to bring a dog on an interview? <laughs> it, Sometimes people don't, they, they don't know. They don't know. So. So I mean, Tiffany, some, you know, and in our area, you know, and, and, and from our vantage point, we hear it from both sides. But, you know, we, we represent business interests. And I have a lot of managers and, and presidents and CEOs saying, look, we're looking for qualified people. But one of the things I hear, especially in the service industry, is this propensity for some folks to want to, they want a job. Mm -hmm. And then they are literally, well, I had a, someone running a large agency tell me, they said they had a job opening and they told the people to be there and everybody said yes. And folks didn't show up for, for the uh, job interview. Then, then when they did give the job, people didn't even show up for the job. I mean, there's some interesting st stories that I'm hearing about this thing. Is this normal? Uh, we've seen a lot of that, too. I mean, our recruiters work very hard on getting people placed. Um, there are a lot of times that they have people set up for interviews. They will show up to the interview, uh, but then don't show up to the first day of work. It's like and then there are some times to where the interview might be set and then they ghost the interview. Um, so to fill in that gap. And to solve that 
problem or that issue or that challenge, um, it's going to be one of those things to where we might have to say, okay, hey, what happened? You know, and sometimes we'll go back and say, hey, you know, we had this interview set up for you. You know, what happened? You know, we're here excuses. Oh, uh, my car didn't work or, you know, I didn't have a babysitter or, you know, um, somebody may have died in the family. You know, we understand that life happens, but there's nothing wrong with just picking up the phone that says, hey, you know, I have a situation going on and here is my situation to at least give us an opportunity to say, okay, hey, let me let me see what I can do to help you with this. Um, whenever I go out and I visit with um, potential clients, you know, sometimes they'd be like, you know, I don't know what's going on. You know, that people would say they come to work or they'll show up for two to three days and then all of a sudden I don't hear from them no more. And, and you know, it kind of frustrates them because it's like, I wanna give somebody an opportunity they want, they want, I've heard people tell me, I just want somebody to show up to work. I don't care if they know how to do the job, don't know how to do the job. I will show them how to do the job. I just want them to show up so that, you know, they can work and I will teach them. Um, or I've had people call in and says, if they can just read a tape measure, I can show them how to do everything else. So um, the, the talent is, is in certain sectors of the industry is very challenging because people will say, yes, I'll show up. You know, and then they don't. And then it's like we won't we we don't necessarily hear from them until like six months from the down the road or maybe like a year later. And we'll be like, well, hey, you know, we had this interview set up for you um, or we you went through the interview and you didn't show up to the job, but you didn't call us to let us know your why. So that that is some things that is happening and and is is unfortunate. And it's like we we got to find a way to say, okay, communication is that that idealistic way to let us know what is going on. So then let's go to this point now. Pride staff in Lake Charles, for employee or employer, how does pride staff make a difference for someone? Pride staff, what we do is, um, I will start with the, the client. Pride staff... Um, we 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 try to we want to sit with the client to understand what's going on, what are their challenges, um, how we might be able to help them with the challenges that they might be facing. Whether it's finding quality employees, we let them know like our vetting process, right? I know Debbie mentioned that you have to have a resume, but with Pride staff, you have to have a resume. It has to be current. You have to have at least six months of current work experience. We're also going to ask you for two references. Um, you're going to do a phone screening with our recruiters. You're going to come in and interview with them face to face. Then they're able to sit there and look at your resume. Um, and sometimes they look at your resume before you come in or while you're in the office with them to let you know what jobs we might have available for you. And so from there, you know, they ask you, can I submit your resume to this employer? They let you know what the job, the job details are. Um, consist of. And then once they submit you to that employer, they're constantly following up with that employer to see if they want to interview with you. Um, for the candidates, um, whenever they come in, um, it's typically almost the same thing. What challenges are you having with finding employ employment? Um, what what qualities do you look for whenever you're going to work for someone? And then that key factor is like, okay, how much are you willing to, uh, how much do you want to make? Um, and then we, we try to match the desires with what the client, the company is, um, has to offer so that we can kind of bridge that gap. And then also, um, if a company has says, hey, you know what, I just want to payroll my employees through you. Um, of course, you have to be, um, you have to go through like our, our prize staff corporate office to make sure that anyone you want to employ through us um, can be qualified through us. So there's a light background check that we do. Um, that our risk department says, yes, this candidate is approved for hire or no, they're not. Um, and then we can take it from there in, in payroll employees. And also the people that we do payroll, if they're working on five staff payroll, then after 60 days, we have full benefits. That's medical, dental, vision, 401k. And, you know, companies can leave people on our payroll for as long as they want to. Um, so that that is some of the things that how it works both for the candidate and the client. So... Uh, we got about five minutes left, and so we could just open it up for just general chat. Miss Miss uh, Debbie, what are some insights you think that folks down here in Southwest Louisiana need to know about prize staff, and also just the general challenges uh, that you know some ways that they can address the issues they have to face every day. Sure. Well, Eric, what I want everyone to know though is that you're not 
so different than the rest of the world. The frustrations that you all have about trying to find good talent, the ghosting, those are nationwide issues also. So you do, do face a lot of the same types of issues that other companies do. Um, but we do take pride in what we do, hence part of our name, Pride Staff, because for us, it's very important to come out and meet companies face-to-face. -face. We're not a transactional type company. And we also pretty much prefer to work with small to mid-sized business. We're not a company that goes after the very large companies to do business with because we'd like to know who the companies are so that we can do a better match on the cultural side. So when we talk to small local businesses and we ask to come out to see you, it's for a variety of reasons. We may see some things that we can help give you um, ideas on how to handle or how to help promote your own business. Um, we talk to so many different business owners in the area so we can share best practices with each other so that we can all learn from each other in the local community and not just, hey, they do this in, in you know Houston, Texas. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't care what they do in Houston, Texas. <laughs> I'm like, Charles, and, and most of you folks, you all know each other or you know our relatives and things like that. But you do want to know if there's good practices that are being done somewhere else, regardless of where it is, that you can implement locally to make you better at business and make your jobs easier. The ghosting feature, I, I keep saying whoever in the United States can figure out how to stop ghosting in general, because it's not just hiring people. But if you run a small hair salon, and Eric, you may not need that as much as uh, Tiffany and I. But I can't tell you how many salon owners complain about people making appointments and then not showing up for them, even though that they've been texted and emailed and called. And then that time slot comes. And when they do and the person doesn't show up, that salon owner just lost an hour of billing time to help pay their bills because someone wouldn't even have the courtesy to say, I'm not showing up. So I don't know how to teach everybody, but I know here in Louisiana, You've got some of the best manners compared to some other cities and states. Who did? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who that for sure. <laughs> but that's an important thing is, you know, for all of us to continue to stay together and look for best practices because it is different times than it was when, when some of us older folks grew up. And we've got to learn how to change because we don't want to be hearing the things that we heard as little kids. Oh, they're just old people. They don't. They don't know what they're doing. You know, I'm the, the newer, younger generation. It's like, no, people still want good communication. Mm -hmm. They still want to be respected. They still want to be heard. And we all want to be able to tell our story. And all your businesses in your community, I mean, they've got a great story to, to be told. And they have been rebuilding. And, you know, the fortitude everybody has getting through those hurricanes and moving forward and not... You know, you can put that weight around your, your neck and let it drag you down and just be done. But no, you shook it off and, and you're moving forward and you're very progressive. And so knowing that, that you're, you're not like compared to the rest of the country, you're in good shape. You really are. Thank you. Tiffany, close it out for us. Sell that right. five at Lake Charles. <laughs> All right. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, especially those that are going to take a look at this video later. Um, again, this is the first of four series. So we're going to do this again um, in May. So hoping that, you know, more people will be able to join us. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. So I'd like to thank both Eric and Debbie um, for their time today and those who are on the call. And so we look forward to seeing you in the next time. So just continue to build and continue to build relationships um, and everything will come together. And Eric, Tiffany and I and all of Pride Staff, we wanted to offer to anyone that's part of the Alliance at no cost, if they would like a current salary survey to compare their wages, as well as what the labor pool for the, the position that they're looking to hire, um, if they would just let Tiffany know, she can get real-time data for them. And like I said, we'll do this at no cost for them. And uh, we're happy to provide that to whoever would like. That sounds like a plan. And with that, we want to say thank you to everyone and who sees this later on. I'm Eric Cormier with the Lions Chamber of Southwest Louisiana. Tiffany, identify yourself before we close. 
I'm Tiffany Horman, Business Development Manager of Pride Staff Lake Charles. And Ms. Debbie? Debbie Zarinsky, Vice President, Franchise Consultant with Pride Staff Home Office. Wonderful. And we want to say we hope everybody have a great day and Southwest Louisiana strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.